One afternoon, my son and I had just out, stepped out of a cafe. He was three years old at the time. And without any warning, he took off, running straight ahead into heavy traffic. I was screaming, calling his name, pleading for him to stop, and without a moment to lose, I managed to grab the back of his T-shirt just in the nick of time, pulling him back just as a car rushed past his little body, inches from us. This was before we knew he was deaf. Since the diagnosis of my son, my life has been immersed in the world of advocacy and activism for children just like him. And I'm not alone. There are thousands of people across this country that are doing the same. And strides have been made. Struggles have moved forward. But there's a lot of good things that have happened. For example, no baby leaves the hospital without having their hearing checked. We have state and federal laws in place meant to ensure that students with disabilities have equal access to education. We even have, in some states, insurance mandates that cover hearing aids for babies and children. So it's not like we haven't achieved anything at all. But we do have to question and ask ourselves one very important thing is that if there still prevails a large opportunity gap, then maybe we are a culture of exclusion. When you have a 50% unemployed and you have another 10 to 20% of severely underemployed, then we do have to look a little deeper and ask ourselves harder questions. As I was thinking about launching my initiative, let me tell you how that came about. There were many indicators along the way. As I started observing a rapidly evolving workforce, I noticed a lot of indicators that made it clear to me that perhaps we are at a crossroads of great opportunity. We have increased remote working styles. People can work out of state. People can work out of their homes. We have increased digital communication within industries and corporations across all sectors. Text messaging, email, platforms like Slack. The U.S. Department of Labor has projected that by the year 2020, there's going to be over a million jobs requiring individuals with computer science skill sets across all sectors, across all states. But here is the, the main points, and there are two of them, that was the catalyst for me launching this. Computer science, computer programming, coding is global and it's visual. It's global and it's visual. It's a visual voice to the world. Perhaps it can do what society has not been able to do. Maybe it is the great equalizer. I believe that the digital age is the great equalizer. As I was formulating the idea of Deaf Kids Code, I was thinking to myself, how is that going to look? How is that going to happen, and what is going to be of the most great impact. So I thought to myself, well, it's going to be hands-on, it's going to be visual, it's going to be interactive, and most importantly, it was going to promote and provoke stimulation. It was very deliberate to stimulate that interest in pursuing this knowledge. 
Let me tell you about when I started searching for feedback among administrators and educators across the country, just trying to get some feedback from them, what they thought. And I'll never, ever forget what the director of Diverse Learners for a city public school district told me. He said, I welcome anything that can break the school-to-couch pattern. School-to-couch pattern. Never thought of it that way, but he's not wrong. With all the early intervention and everything that we're doing, this is the paradigm, this is the result. So feeling as though I had nothing to lose, let me tell you about my very first workshop. I was going to work with a group of middle schoolers over summer school, and I had asked the teacher some feedback. Tell me about these kids that I'm going to be working with. And she said, I'm just warning you that they're behind by several years. English, math especially, on average, these kids are three years behind. So, of course, I myself started questioning, oh my gosh, how on earth are they going to figure out command sequences, algorithms, complex problem solving, if they're on average three years behind on math? But let me tell you, what happened that day was nothing short of extraordinary. It was. It really was. These kids were immersed in deep, autonomous learning. They were executing tasks and writing code as though they had had some previous experience, as if they had done any of this before, and I can tell you that they hadn't. Less than 1% of the hundreds of children that I've had the privilege of working with have had any knowledge or notion of computer science. It was so unbelievable what these kids were doing that the teacher took me aside and she said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you tell me again, what are these kids doing? I said, they're programming in JavaScript. It was so magical what was happening that the principal of the school called in the superintendent to come in. They all knew the enormity of what was happening in that moment. The superintendent came in, being a longtime educator himself, took out his personal cell phone, and started taking video footage of what was happening. We all knew what was going down was unbelievable. From that day forward, I decided without a doubt that I was going to spread this knowledge to as many deaf and hard of hearing children as I possibly can. There have been so many moments that have been magical, is no other way to put it. Let me tell you about a few weeks ago. I had the privilege of working with a group of girls. And in our hardware segment, I was going to give them a challenge. I had been saving up our garbage, our recyclables, and I dumped it in the middle of the classroom. And I told them, OK, you have to figure out a way to repurpose this garbage. Make it useful, create a gadget, do something, whatever you want. They have to go through the whole design process, right? Visualization, sketch it out, wire it up, construct it. Let me show you what they did. That's a cereal box. That's a discarded carton. 
berry holder, cardboard, all of that in one hour. They did that in one hour with no prior experience. That is the next generation of our problem solvers. This is who we should be embracing to be the next problem solvers. This is the next generation of greatness. I don't know about you, but I welcome them to search for resolving some of our world's greatest challenges. I welcome that, and we should too. We, all of us, should. Because we ultimately are the greatest beneficiaries of such talent. And the notion that they may end up on the couch should be criminal. For a population where the majority of them do not have an intellectual disability, we should not be so easily accepting of this. What I have learned is that the capacity for greatness is simply seeing what others don't. So simple, not complicated. I started this having no research, having no data, no evidence that this was going to work. I created this organization on two simple things intuition and a blind belief that somehow this was going to be it. And I've been so fortunate, so fortunate that I'm right. We are right. We should have an ecosystem embracing our children and cultivating the next generation. Let me tell you how many emails I have received from these kids writing to me and saying, I want to continue learning. My dream now is to build a website. I see myself as an app developer. Just two days ago, I received an email, a girl that wants to be an, a digital animator. She's saying, tell me how. Let's talk about inclusion for a second. Inclusion and diversity. The data is out, and we know that it is a powerful economic driver. We know it makes companies and industries more competitive. And regardless of what anybody says, it should not be a political debate. The value of this. Inclusion and diversity is a societal imperative. No questions asked. I'm going to leave you with this quote. Sometimes it is the people no one imagines anything of that do the things that no one can imagine. Thank you. <laughs>